Welcome to the Poisoner's Cabinet. I'm Sinead. And I'm Nick. And this is your weekly podcast exploring the lives of the great poisoners and macabre murders from across the centuries and creating curious cocktails inspired by the tales that we tell. And it's episode 83. 83. 83. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're not impressed by 83. 83. No, I shan't be impressed till we reach 100. No numbers in no between. No numbers. No numbers in between. There's actually nothing. We're going, next week is 100. <laughs> Very exciting. <laughs> We're just skipping all the other We're numbers. We're skipping 17 episodes. I don't know. There's some fun numbers in between. 88. Is that a good number? 92. Why, why are these good numbers? Don't you know? No. Well, you have to wait and find out. Oh, you know. something exciting happening there, I feel. <laughs> really set myself up You now. really have. <laughs> these, these better be bloody awesome. And not just you doing bingo calls at the beginning of each episode. Pretty much. Or just letting off a glitter cannon and then just staring at you. <laughs> That'd be fine. No, not, not in my house. <laughs> Why make, not in your house? Make a terrible mess. <laughs> make a horrible, glittery mess. In your house, great, lovely, love that. That that's actually your persona summed up beautifully. Excited by glitter cannons and then immediately furious by the mess. <laughs> It's so true. <laughs> I like sparkly things. Someone clean it up. <laughs> it's, it's the duality of my existence. Well, Fun time. It's cleaning time now. <laughs> How are you, Nick? I'm all right. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Come up. You're in a jolly mood. You made a, a curious cocktail when I came in. I say, Sinead arrived after running the length of Kent. Uh, 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 no. Well, she made it sound like she did. Uh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, no, I totally did. Ran, ran a 10k, man. I, I staggered around the block trying to do the couch to 5k. And now all of the phlegm in my body is congealing at the back of my throat for which no is, good reason. Which is a delight. So I generously said, would you like a drink? I would love a drink. I begged for water. You had water. <laughs> You had but your you, thimble of water. You took it away. None of took that. Took it away. None of that. There's no booze in there. <laughs> Made her a delightful drink. She threw it in my face. I am drinking it now. Yeah. Well, what? Because you have no other choice. Because what does it have in it? Excellence, it's, joy, and wonder. It is. It, have we had the cocktail on we've the show the before? Pro- yes, the procrastination. We've had it on the show before. And I recently bought some limoncello, so I thought I want to make it. So a procrastination is is a combination of the following ingredients. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what, what I'm saying. What is there. it today? Go on, tell us all. What is so, it? What's in it? Gin. It's gin, dry vermouth, uh, limoncello, and a drop. A teeniest hint of chartreuse. No! And he puts it down in front of me and I go, oh God. I she know liked coming. it in the episode. Now, maybe I was drunk in the episode or I'd lost my mind. It's not bad. It's not bad. It's very like a Vesper, but again. Anyway, this is uh, not the cocktail yeah. of the week. This no, is... I know. But so... then this is now the thing, that pre-cocktail cocktail <laughs> that we're enjoying. But God, you can taste the chartreuse. Oh, shush. Okay. Any poisonings this week, apart from me with chartreuse? Well, you now, yes. Mm. Um, a new. <laughs> so I don't know why I found that so funny. <laughs> oh, please be interviewed by the police at some point. <laughs> yeah, that's my interview voice. <laughs> like a slow consideration. Have you killed someone? Let me think about that for a minute. A new. A new. <laughs> <laughs> and they would giggle as well and go, oh, he can't possibly be guilty. Oh, how funny he is. <laughs> Off you go, good sir. Well, speaking of being interviewed by police and poisoning people with chartreuse, I think it's time for us to thank our delicious Patreon subscribers. Indeed, we showed their lovely bunch of people. So thank you very much to Laura Bell. To Alice Quite. To B. Morrissey. To Ailish Hall. Tonya Mitchell. And Annie Reardon. Thank you so much, darlings. You're splendid. Thank you so much, you beautiful, beautiful, very, very sexy people, especially Ailish, who is my cousin, and who's <sighs> been listening for a very long time. And then and she's she... only just joined Patreon now. Which is <laughs> fine. Patreon is flexible, people. Come and join it when you are goddamn ready. Indeed. And be prepared for the onslaught of brilliance. There's much excitement there. I love the fact your dad listens and then comments on the swearing. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Sinead swears far too much. You swear as well. Yeah, but I get away with it. Am I leading you down a dark path? It's it's entirely your fault. You are leading me astray. (laughs) Before this podcast, Nick was a pure and humble soul. Exactly. I had never sworn in my life before I mentioned it. And had never had a drink. drink. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) But your dad likes the show. (laughs) He's quite happy on this weird path you've gone down. (laughs) Well, Nick. Yes. Are you ready? Mm -hmm. Mm. Two, four, two, yes. Mm. I'm intrigued. What? It's much like a police interview. Yes, it is. It's very good. I'm excited. To drink cocktails and talk about poison. Uh, go on then. Or Ooh. we could drink 
poison and talk about cocktails. Yeah, that sounds like an equally good option. This has made me really drunk. No, really I've, have. I've had one of these and it's gone straight to my head. <laughs> You've got that crazy look in your I eye, have. Nick. I've You've not got even that crazy had the look. actual cocktail yet. So <laughs> God knows how this is going to go. You need to stop making really strong cocktails no! before I must make more. We even start the show. Last week we we had a red hook before having the delicious yes, the right was. hand. And I was I was wasted after that episode. But did not also last week we went then went to a cocktail bar to meet some friends and another three cocktails. Oh, I, I hardly think that counts. <laughs> that could not possibly explain the waste of the day after. <laughs> I know the whole day after I was like, why? Do why does need- Nick make his cocktail so strong? <laughs> and then why do we go to cocktail bars? Looking at myself in the mirror, going Sinead. You're doing great. <laughs> Good. Okay, we are going to go with the first one. Let's yes. drink some cocktails, Let's. talk about poison and murder and macabre things. Hooray, hooray, hooray. It is Nick's story this week. It is. Exciting times. Good luck, because of course we can't, we can't, we can't possibly have a story without a cocktail in hand. As you know, dear listeners, every week we choose a secret ingredient that is inspired by the tale that we tell that will mm-hmm. flavour our cocktail of the week. Mm-hmm. Nick's story, so Nick's pick, he is chewing a pen. I'm intrigued. <laughs> Pretending it's a pipe. <laughs> so the secret ingredient this week is, Nick? Is some coins. It is coin. Cross my palm with coin, shall we? Indeed. This is good. So coins specifically rather than money. Yes, indeed. Coins rather than money. Obviously, because money, greatest poison of them all. Quite indeed. Coins, just slightly upsetting. I'm pleased with this week's cocktail. I mean, it could be be dreadful. The drink could be dreadful. But I'm pleased with the the name of the cocktail and the ingredient and how it links into the story. I I hope I will be too. But um, yeah, so the cocktail itself, (laughs) who knows? After the mole mole incident last week, (laughs) which actually turned out quite well for all of us. Okay, so with coins, coins. I'm I'm, I'm very tempted to keep saying coin is in an oldie way of going, ah, we, we must we must deal in coin, <laughs> my friend. Coin. Here is a purse of coin, which I'm not going to give to you. <laughs> what have you come up with, Nick? So this week, mm-hmm. we are having a Fellyman. <gasps> I love I this. I knew you would like it. <laughs> yes. Oh, my little heart just went to flutter. The Fellyman. The Fellyman. Oh, God, you must give the Fellyman coin. <laughs> Coins on your eyes in... to pay the boatman. <laughs> My brain is exploding. Sinead is losing her shit right now. Rubbing my temples right now. (laughs) Yes. Coins for Caron the Ferryman. We're having one of these this week. Excited. And this could be terrible. I'd still be be happy. It's got some, (laughs) it's got ingredients we have never used before. (gasps) Goodness. So it's exciting time all around. I was so pleased when this worked and it was so touch and go. Of course, I left everything to the last minute and didn't order the ingredients I needed till yesterday and waiting after my office shut waiting outside for the Amazon man to arrive with these bottles. Googling, going, what can I make instead if he doesn't turn up? What can I make? And then he did. And all is well. Did the Amazon man emerge from the mists <laughs> with a boat? No. Guiding his way in a cloak across the car park of your office. <laughs> Not quite that exciting, unfortunately. Now, have we ever had such a good name and it's this a, much of a, a reaction? It's a good name for a cocktail. It's so good. Well, and it just goes to show the kind of way our minds lean. <laughs> Anything to do with folklore and mysticism, yay. Bring it on. I'm excited. Well, without further ado, I think it is time for us to go into the poisoner's cabinet kitchen and shake up a storm. So we'll see you in a minute. We'll see you in a bit. And we're back. Yalla. So, a ferryman. The ferryman. The ferryman has called. Yes, Carolyn has visited. Ooh. In a slightly, slightly sort of ambery, paley sort of way. It is. It's a paley, tumblery kind of drink. And I will point out that Karen does sound good and terrible at the same time as the boatman as the ferryman that's why i always refer to him as the ferryman karen the ferryman he knew a lot about hr had many thoughts on how that boat should have been run absolutely yes. <laughs> but yay a ferryman so oh, mm. it looks like a, a robust kind of drink well indeed it looks a bit foamy i'm worried it does look foamy i'm not sure why it's foamy <laughs> okay that's not a good sign it's the ferryman's curse <laughs> <laughs> but well there was shaking so that makes it foamy I let's think. give it a go well yes merry christmas, merry christmas. to the underworld mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Ooh. Ooh. That was unexpected. That's, um, oh, that's interesting. It's not, it's not undelicious. I find it quite undelicious. I must admit. 
I don't mind it. I don't, ooh, mm. it's got a really weird got aftertaste. A very, very bitter twang at the end. Yeah, like I think this is definitely a second and a third sip, just to make, <laughs> yeah. sure, just to absolutely Indeed, make that's... sure. It's got a beautiful citrusy start. That's interesting. But it really has a bitter aftertaste, mm. and I don't know what's in it. All I've got is citrus and bitterness. It's much like my left. See, this, yeah, it's one of those ones that the second and the third they really help. Once you're over that initial shock, oh, yeah. and bitter. Much like the much vaunted Negroni, mm. once you're over that initial bitter mm. uh, hitch and your your palate gets used to that, I mean, it actually becomes something quite lovely. Oh, that was really nice, that second <laughs> sip. I've definitely got a hint of what was in it. Very, very much a bitter aftertaste. Far yeah. more than, well, I don't know, actually. I would say far more than a Negroni, but I'm so oh. used to Negronis. Well, that's the thing, because I mean... I know what's causing that, and it's not something we've had before. Oh, um, okay. So, yeah, it's quite a quite a different taste. Talk mm. us through it, because I could guess at it, but I don't want to get it wrong. So, okay, yeah, so the ferryman. So we have a base of gin is Ooh. the primary ingredient. It's the way to hell. <laughs> As you said, we there's a big citrus hit. We've got lemon and lime. Lemon and lime, both, together both, at last. Both the juices combined. Okay. The other two ingredients we have are things we've not had before. One is a liqueur called Sinar. Well, that's dangerously <laughs> close to science. It is. Isn't it? It's not, yeah, you're not the first person to point that one out. Um, but it is. A, <laughs> it's quite traditional. It's an Italian. I'm going to have to say this. It's an Italian herbal liqueur. Oh, for God's sake! Um, <laughs> that is centuries and centuries old. It is made from artichokes. Whoa. Okay. It's made never from, it's heard made, of yeah, this. Yeah, it's made from artichoke. Mm. I've, I've, yeah, I've never had cause to buy a bottle before. Because um, <laughs> when, when would you? So <laughs> there's not enough artichoke liqueur in this dinner party. <laughs> so that's gonna be one that's gonna be in the back of the cupboard for when God knows have how long. You ever had cause to buy uh, artichoke? Well, based now <laughs> does come up in a number of cocktails. Really? It really it does actually. It's surprising if you look at it. Uh, it comes up in in quite a few different things because of that really bitter twang. It's a, it's an alternative Ooh. to Campari. It's got quite a different yes. taste to an, uh, Campari, whereas Campari is a bit can be a bit softer and a bit rounder. This is mm. quite. Uh, What's heavy. the final? And then, sorry, the final ingredient is a ginger liqueur. Oh, a ginger liqueur. Yeah. So not just a ginger syrup. This is a ginger liqueur. This is an alcoholic ginger liqueur. Oh. Uh, full disclosure: uh, you had mentioned ginger would be in this, and I was expecting a really big hit of ginger. And now I can taste a you little can, tiny you can, hint you can, of it. It is there. You can smell it Oh, you it definitely well, yeah. can. You definitely can. It's, but it's very subtle. Probably because the... What is the liqueur Cynar. called? Cynar. C-Y-N-A-R. Cynar. It's definitely cyanide. This is how I die. <laughs> but some herbal-based liqueur. Mm. That seems to overpower everything, but not in a terrible way. It's one of those ones that I think is probably calmed down by the other th- ingredients in there. It's certainly the dominant taste, but it is somewhat mellowed by the other... It's mm. taking the edges off. Now, full disclosure, the, the, the actual ingredient of this also calls for celery bitters, Oy. which I was not able to get hold of. Could have just um, put some celery in there. So that I don't know how much of a difference that would have made. Bitters generally Ooh. a very potent flavour, so that may have changed things a bit. Unfortunately, yes, I wasn't able to get them, so I have left them out. I mean, I think we do need for my benefit and everyone else's like an extra patreon episode about bitters <laughs> we've talked about them on the show before but i'd be really interested to know what difference they make so celery bitters so to celery me bitters. sounds ridiculous it sounds like <laughs> well what possible difference could they make but then when you have the mole bitters i've bought you black walnut bitters yeah. you have orange bitters they do really make a they difference do. with a S- tiny amount celery is intriguing i must admit i've never had more well, never knowingly had celery bitters in a drink before so i'm quite intrigued about what celery bitters is like so i think i would have to try and find a bottle if anyone um, has tried celery bitters well, and can know. give us a review please please do write on social media or send to us about what you think of celery bitters do they make any difference are they tasty or are they just weird <laughs> it's a really interesting drink yeah i'm no it's, it's one of those ones that's, it's growing on me a lot um, definitely it's not unpleasant i dare say you need to have done this podcast for the best part of a year and a half for your palate to have become so accustomed to the onslaught of flavors that is put in front of you because nick has introduced me to far more herbally flavors i find this quite palatable now after two or three drinks i think if if i'd had this at the start of this show i'd be screaming and flipping the table and going no it's bitter it's bitter oh, it's bitter absolutely i don't yeah. know if I love the lemon and lime combination Mm. in there. I think having never tried the artichoke liqueur, I don't know how bitter it is on its own, but lemon and lime together 
it does create a very bitter aftertaste. It's true. So, Beautifully yeah. citrusy, but but very bitter. And then you have this liqueur, and then the ginger syrup seems to be drowning underneath it, going, <laughs> please, let me up, let me well, up. Well, we shall do some experimentation. Wow, yeah. It's clearly a sophisticated drink. That's the thing. Is it's a, it's a good drink. Yeah. It's a good combination in there. It's probably just one where you go, mm, too bitter for me, or yum, 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 Absolutely. yum, 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 yum. Yeah, indeed. Um, you, a lot of the cocktails that... I tend to make <laughs> I fall into that category it would seem <laughs> me crying and going no I don't like it <laughs> yeah also no. you don't go and buy a bottle of cyanide just for this one it's not worth it or a bottle of cyanide or a bottle of cyanide <laughs> it sounds so similar Nick I mean it's on air everybody unless they're oh my god what if we never edit this and he doesn't put it out and this is how I died but um it's, it's an interesting one. You can sub the sign out for Campari. It wouldn't have quite had the same thing, but it would be not a million miles out. You could grow mm. to You'd love grow, it. Indeed, as we have. Like the ferryman itself. It's mm. mystical. It's interesting. What is it? Mm, can yeah. you love it? Could you ever love it? <laughs> could, could you, you ever, ever love, love the ferryman? ferryman? <laughs> Every journey is a taste of bitterness to you. It's very apt. Yeah, absolutely. It all works. The person who did this is a genius. Uh. I'm really actually now thrown <laughs> by how apt this drink is for the name the ferryman and all the myth- mythology that is associated with them <laughs> well the recipe will be out this week so you can mix one up but nick with our ferryman's mm. firmly in hand slightly frightened <laughs> is it time for a story it is most definitely time for a story but before i get too carried away in telling an exciting tale first i do have to say thank you Ooh. i have to say thank you to vicky newton and her website not magic for the excellent research on this particular story and i also i am um, i believe that vicky actually listens to our podcast yeah um, as in one of her write-ups, she actually references one of our earlier episodes. <laughs> so, <laughs> so thank you. Um, I'm I'm now looking at your work as well. So. <laughs> We love you, Rah. Vicky. You see the circle It all, it all of comes life. round, absolutely. So, as it is spooky season, I did think we needed a tale with something of the the other, something of the mysterious in it. <laughs> um, so today we have the tale of William Dove and Henry. Harrison. Now we're going to start the tale with William Dove. Okay. This chap here. Now William is born in July 1827 near Leeds um, into a devoutly Methodist family. But William's parents were later described as being strict without being severe and kind without being overindulgent. Well, that's the perfect amount. And perfect, I mean, exactly. Perfect combination, indeed. And their children are raised with daily worship and under a strict moral compass there's a compass above their bed there was a big compass absolutely it was like god no god (laughs) (laughs) now young william did not take too kindly to his religious upbringing he had a reputation as a bit of a wild and wayward child on and on occasion this youthful exuberance would take a slightly darker turn he had a habit of putting lit candles in baskets and hiding them in cupboards (laughs) (laughs) and then giggling as the servants and his parents tried to break open the doors to put out the flames oh so it actually caught fire yes absolutely so he put them in like a wicker basket or something like that he would put a candle in put it hide it in the cupboard lock the cupboard run away smoke would start billowing out oh right i just thought he was putting lights in cupboards and everyone's like oh my god what a jape and they were like this is no, just no, no, very the, annoying the cupboard is now on fire um <laughs> <laughs> so he would chase his sisters round the house with a red hot poker threatening to burn them and then lock them in their rooms and on another less fun occasion Jesus. um he hung the family cat out <gasps> the window by its tail what no no immediately no <laughs> he couldn't he no none of that so yet yeah, not a not a particularly well adjusted child no <laughs> <laughs> As William entered his teenage years, it was a sign that it's time for him to get a trade. With the ever-increasing population of the city of Leeds, um, food is in huge demand. So William's parents reason that they should apprentice him to a farmer. And they do so to a farmer by the name of Frankish, where mm. William can learn how to look after animals and what crops to plant and things. And eventually he will run his own farm and all will be well and he would make his fortune selling this food into the city. Did they learn nothing from the cat incident? Well, yeah. <laughs> Let us put him immediately in the vicinity of animals. Yeah, you may have a point on that one. William is say he's not the ideal apprentice. He is not really one for learning, much preferring to set the farmer's wagons on fire. That's quite fun. Or maybe even dousing his own bedroom curtains in alcohol and setting those on fire. It's also quite fun. Interesting. 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 He does indeed, as you have alluded to, delight in tormenting the livestock on the farm. No. Inventing various ways to cause pain and discomfort. Though never outright 
killing them. I wasn't going to go into specifics, but I can do if you want. I I, I don't think I want to know. Then, then fair just, enough. Just, just unpleasantness ensued. No one is pointing anything out now at this point. <laughs> the farmer, Frankish, he is obviously not at all happy about what's going on around the farm. He knows that. And he frequently sort of beats William to discipline him. As, as was the style of the time. This was uh, the style of the time. This unstable, violent man. <laughs> let's beat him further. Let's beat him, because that'll show him. That'll show him the error of his ways. Now, the farmer actually goes so far as to even write to William's parents to complain, um, to hope that they might talk some sense into the young man. And this has made him a little success on this one. All they get is a, like a, a very apologetic note back and some cash to cover his inconveniences. <laughs> Terribly sorry that our son has been torturing your animals. Here's five pounds. Ha ha, he's your problem <laughs> he's now. He's your problem now. Eventually, when William turns 21, his apprenticeship is over. I mean, he is, of course, no better equipped to run his own farm than he was when he started. Really. No. He was good at the practical stuff. He knew sow stuff here, harvest stuff over there. Then more intellectual, like the planning of crop rotations mm. and, and how to look after manage and manage livestock and when to get them to market and all that and sort when of stuff. not to burn and them. when not to set them on fire was entirely beyond him. <laughs> his father, seeing that he was not going to cope on his own, found another farmer to take him in for another year to try and sort of further his education. Why? Um, a farmer Gibson. Now, farmer Gibson may have been slightly understating matters when he said that he did not consider William one of the brightest farmers he had ever met. <laughs> that is a great appraisal right there. <laughs> yeah. For an apprenticeship scheme, we've all had them. God, they they don't know how to use their thumbs. That's not good. But eventually, after considerable influence from his father, William does get his farm of his own. Um, it was how? a rather, Well, his father is quite respected in the sort of Methodist community. He has got some in, some influence. So he's able to lean on the right people to perhaps grease some palms oh with coin God. to get him this particular farm. <laughs> give now, him this weird farm and those animals are just like wide-eyed shaking at the knees. <laughs> I mean, it's not the best farm around. It's a rather isolated <laughs> yeah. plot. It's rather in the middle of nowhere. No one else really wants it. There's one so, pig, one there's, chicken. Exactly. There's one pig in a corner just traumatised. And there's um, <laughs> a horse that's really a cow. <laughs> so, yeah, so William moves there and he moves to the farm in 1852, taking two hands that his father has employed to assist him. But William is a headstrong chap. He, he's foolish, but headstrong. Um, and he will not take guidance or advice from anyone. Clearly. He frequently gets into arguments with his workers and then screams and shouts and blames them for when the plans obviously go entirely wrong. He planted an apple orchard and then two weeks later ploughed the field over because it was just taking far too long. What? Those apple trees, they're taking far too long. Um, <laughs> plough it over, start again. This does sound like me as a farmer. This is true. This is very good, very much me. Apples have not grown instantly. <laughs> I sow the seeds. I grow the seeds. I will kill everything. <laughs> On another occasion, he harvests uh, an acre of barley when it's still green and, and completely unripe. Oh, no. But because he had seen another farmer do it and he didn't want the other farmer to get there first. What? Another farmer had been seen harvesting his field. Obviously, perhaps he had planted a bit earlier or something like that. Earlier. Exactly. But William's going, no, I'm not going to be left behind. I'm not going to be last. I'm going to harvest my fields as well. And of course, gets absolutely nothing. And it's barley, the greatest <laughs> poison of them all. On another occasion, one night, he sends, um, sends a lad to a nearby farm to purchase two linseed cakes um, from, the, from the farmer or the farmer's <laughs> wife. He takes these and feeds these to cows um, he is planning on taking to market the following day, believing that the cake is going to fatten them up overnight and they will be perfect for selling. Cows love cake. They famously love <laughs> they a bit of cake. They famously love some cake. And also get fat overnight and yeah. balloon up That's for how it, that's how it works. That's how it Does, works. He has... Has he no concept of time? He is, he's not a good farmer. Let's just say that. He's, is, not, he's a, not a good human being. <laughs> it's just farming aside, he doesn't understand life and the universe. I will feed this cow a cake. It will be plump for market. <laughs> feed the, <laughs> that energy. Feed the cow cake. Get it a nice big sponge. <laughs> Fatten it up fine. with a few lasagnas. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> the poor cow. The cow might, might love it. Yeah, like, but a cow's got, I, no, no. Cake. I like cake. No, I mean, it wouldn't because it's not a human goddamn being. <laughs> the cow's like, please, just some cud. 
<laughs> one evening at a, at a gathering at a local school he makes the acquaintance of a miss harriet jenkins harriet is there visiting her brother john who taught mathematics at the school no. um now william and harriet strike up a fast friendship and after only after a couple of weeks william proposes to harriet now Ooh. she is a bit more discerning she takes her time to consider her options but finally after a couple of months she agrees to the proposal now a friend of harriet's brother john tells him that he really should look into the, the character of this william dove chap uh, before allowing his sister to marry but john is a modern and forward-thinking man he says his sister is old enough to make up her own mind she knows what she oh, wants good for him she can decide on her own husband even if he's a complete prat and b- besides I mean the reputation of the dove family is second to none his Ooh. father is a respected methodist person mm. he's well known within the community he has um, a shit farm uh, yeah but I mean, he he admits that he knows little about william himself but harriet would not make a silly choice oh he, god this is decides. so bad this is one of those instances where they said let the woman make her own choice and then later on they be like you see what happens, <laughs> see what happens. when we let women make their own choices it all goes horribly wrong no <laughs> votes for you the two oh, are married in August 1852 and Harriet moves into the farm. The couple take on a succession of maids to help the new the lady of the house, but each leave quite quickly. Uh, yeah. One, Emma Wilkinson, was there for six months before leaving, citing William's conduct as being not that of a reasonable man. Ew. She leaves. Emma Spence said she was so frightened of his tantrums that she left after only a few weeks. Oh, no. The couple have been together for less than a year and they were already at each other's throats yeah. when harriet's brother john visits he never knows what he's going to find on one day he f- would find his brother-in-law miserably depressed the next he was over the moon entirely delighted he said i have known him most devout and, and religious one day and a reprobate the next not a good sign not a good sign not a good sign indeed one day william is out in the fields looking at cows or something and planning the cakes planning, he planning the cakes them. he's going to buy for the cows but he strikes up a conversation with one of his laborers um, a chap named john hardcastle the conversation as it often does turns to the subject of wizards <laughs> <laughs> looking at the cow the cake didn't work. I need a wizard to fatten the you know, cow. One thing I actually realised while I'm writing this episode is how fun the word wizard is to say. <laughs> <laughs> Every time I typed it, I was like, wizard. Oh, that's a great word. Love it. You can't not laugh at the word wizard. It's a great word. It's <laughs> a fantastic word. says, uh, let's strike up a conversation about wizards. <laughs> oh, mate. Okay, of course. So, of, course. of course, it comes up in conversation. <laughs> Um, and now, William has been wondering if such people were real. Well, if anything weird happens, the wizard did wizard it. Did it. Absolutely. In episode, wizard, wizard. <laughs> I mean, it was the time of wise men and wise women and things like that. They were trusted members of the community. It was so the time of wizards. It was the time of the wizard. <laughs> So, as I say, John Hardcastle is exactly the right person he needed to speak to about this subject. Um, Hardcastle, he not only believes entirely in the power and skill of these wise men, but he knew the very one that William should consult. Hooray! Henry Harrison, the wizard of the South Market. Not the president. No. Oh, that was William the, Henry Harrison. That's William Henry Harrison. That's an entirely <laughs> different chap. He died in 40 days. <laughs> William revealed to John Harcastle that he had actually he had just given notice on the farm and he was rather regretting his actions no doubt done in one of his his rages or in one of his tempers he said no fuck this I'm off gave his notice and then thought oh that was <laughs> stupid <laughs> now he could have appealed to the to the agent and Mr King but William had not exactly been a great tenant over the years um, and Mr King had seemed quite delighted to receive this notice so William was rather sceptical that Mr King would agree for him to stay instead could Henry Harrison employ his mystical ways to influence Mr King <laughs> now John don't laugh it's serious okay all, all serious now all serious wizard. 
John could vouch for the wizard's skill personally. Mm. Um, at one time, before his employment um, at the farm, um, he had found himself in debt. And he had come to the knowledge that the bailiffs were planning on visiting him, seizing his possessions. Um, Hardcastle went himself to Harrison, who said that he would use his magic to sort everything out. It shan't be a bother. I will deal with it. On the day of the bailiff's visit, the horse bolted, causing the men to be thrown from the cart onto Ooh. the ground, and they were badly injured. The men were confined to their beds for so long that John had the time to take all of his possessions out and hide them away somewhere safe, where the bailiffs would not find them. And John Hardcastle was certain that Henry Harrison was the wizard William needed, and agreed to set up a meeting the next time they went into Leeds. Now a little bit about... The wise man. I'm trying not to think of the word wizard when you say the serious <laughs> bits. I'm trying to think, oh, how mystical and weird. No. Wizard! Wizard! wizard. <laughs> so we Henry... call him a warlock? No, no, wizard. He, he's he, different. He, no, exactly. No, he's, he's a wizard. But he was born in 1816. You really milked that, <laughs> didn't yes. you? He was born in 1816. 16. <laughs> the most wizardy of years. They all, there, was a, there was a rush of them, there was. <laughs> He married uh, a woman called Jane in 1833, uh, but he struggles to provide for his young family. And when Henry eventually loses his job, the family are left destitute and reliant on support from the parish. Hmm. Jane leaves and takes their two young children to live with her father, away from this man who could not support them. Hmm. Uh, Henry does not follow. He is now quite happy that he is by himself. He does not have these people to support and he is determined to make his own way, initially resorting to petty theft and vagrancy to get by. Nah. He seems to drift from place to place, eventually ending up in a lodging house in Moor End in Leeds in 1844. His landlady, a woman called Elizabeth Brown, is quite taken with her new lodger um, and they start up a relationship. And though they never marry, Henry, of course, is still married to Jane, mm. um, Elizabeth would go around and, and introduce herself as Elizabeth Harrison and they, they'd seem to live as man and wife. Mm -hmm. The couple moved to South Market, an area of Leeds, where Elizabeth sets up a grocer's shop, a quite respectable business. But Henry, though, is fixed on more esoteric pursuits <laughs> and in the rooms above the grocers, he sets himself up as a wizard. The entire time that you've been telling his backstory, I have been picturing him in some sort of rinsewind style, pointy hat and robe covered with stars and moons. Sure. That's uh, it. Wizard garb all absolutely. the way through that. That's, that's how it works. That's how it works. <laughs> he initially sells sort of a sort of herbs and concoctions of his own devising, but soon branches out into the more lucrative world of spells and charms. Lovely. By the 1850s, he has further expanded his services and is describing himself as an astrological doctor and dentist. <laughs> nice! At this point. Um, and in the census, he puts his occupation as a doctor and water caster. Ooh, a water caster. Now, a water oh, caster. I like. So water casting. Mm. I was intrigued by this. So water casting is the practice of scrying with urine. Yes. Delightful, delightful practice. It is. Um, in previous centuries, it was widely accepted mm. as medical fact, entirely legitimate, mm -hmm. um, but with advances in science and such like, it has rather fallen out of favour. You can't use we to tell the future anymore. You can't, but he thought he could. And so there are still those who were convinced and were able to convince others that they could use urine to determine perhaps the sex of an unborn child mm. or how long someone would live. And perhaps even if they, the person was a victim of witchcraft yeah. or could be told through we. <laughs> <laughs> it still can. It trust still me. can. Absolutely. <laughs> we scrying, absolutely no basis in that. Statues, though, you can tell the future by that. That's absolutely. still a thing. <laughs> yeah. Tea leaves, not a problem. We, yeah. nah. Tea leaves, entrails, statues, the clouds. All of those entirely legitimate scrying methods. Absolutely. The bodily functions. No. <laughs> it's in October 1854 that William Dove has his first appointment with the wizard. Spooky month. The spooky month, <laughs> indeed. But William explains his predicament and asks for Henry's help to keep the tenancy of his farm. The following month, Henry visits the Dove farm and he performs a ritual that he claims will protect the inhabitants and keep away any unwanted visitors. Now, of course, William is entirely willing to believe this and thinking it's going to keep away the land agent or anyone sent to evict him. He is happy to go along with this. Henry places a series of copper coins. Hey! 
Yay! With hieroglyphical inscriptions oh. on them at the entrance points to the farm and hid another in the house itself. The charm coins would apparently ward off anyone who meant William harm and mm. stop them crossing the boundary into the farm. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, I get it. He also oh. gives William a spell that is apparently supposed to help him persuade the land agent to renewing the tenancy. Harriet is somewhat less impressed. Um, (laughs) by this rather shabby looking wizard who her husband has invited into their home she's standing in the corner while the man flings coins around the place while wearing his homemade cape yeah. covered in stars and moons she is she is she's not at all happy about this i mean she is a good god-fearing woman Aye. um and wizardry is of course the work of the devil the couple's arguments grow more and more angry and bitter as william continues to see and get advice from henry but william manages to hold on to the farm and in his mind, it is the wise man who has done it. Mm. Everyone else tells him that it's mainly because the farm is so out of the way and relatively small that no one else really wants it. <laughs> um, <laughs> but no, he is convinced that Henry Harrison has done the impossible. He has. Over the next, over the next year, William makes more and more visits to Henry, um, consulting him on everything from what crops he should plant to the problems in his marriage. Wizards know best is, yeah. the, is, the, way, is the way forward. Wizards will be very happily take your money and just <laughs> say oh these herbs will calm your <laughs> wife or they'll inflame her passion just 20 quid 20 quid 20 quid please 20 quid, 20 quid at that day and age would be a year's salary <laughs> absolutely that's an awful lot of money <laughs> but he paid it that's he why did. his he farm was, was shit mm. by the end of 1855 William and Harriet's relationship is in pieces William once again goes to the wise man to see if anything can be done to salvage this relationship this situation at home Aww. this time the wizard comes up with a rather stark prediction Henry tells William that in the new year he will become a widow not no. only that but he will also remarry to a woman who would have auburn hair a light complexion and a good fortune okay um, he also went on to say that he really should have married someone like this in the first place <laughs> It would have been so much better if you had just done that to begin with. That's a bit bitchy, really. <laughs> I mean, predict the future by all means, but don't just go, have you done this in the first place? What, 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 what am I going to do with that? <laughs> it's like going getting a tarot reading, going, if you had just done all of this shit before I told you what was happening, this would have been a less of a waste of my exactly, time. Exactly, yeah, precisely. It would have been... Stop messing around. I'm wasting wow. my time. <laughs> wow. Now, William is, of course, torn. He is shocked that his wife is prophesied to die. But also, the new neighbour who moved in just a few months ago fits that description pretty damn well. Oh, my um, God. <laughs> so, He's like, no, my wife is going to die, but the neighbour's going to hurt. Yeah, but also, if it's meant to be, then it's meant to be. If of fate course. has decided, if destiny has decreed that this is going to happen, then this is going to happen. Oh, my God. So be it. Not long after Henry Harrison's latest prediction, William is hit by inspiration. William had become fascinated with the case of Dr. William Palmer. No, yes, (laughs) yes! William Palmer! (laughs) Who was on trial for the murder of a friend Mm. using strychnine. Strychnine. Um, And he had read everything about the doctor and his methods that he could find. Including chicken. (laughs) Including chicken. Chicken, his horse. <laughs> <laughs> oh, episode three. This one, I think it was. On a, on a visit to Henry, um, William casually, casually <laughs> drops into conversation. The question of what Henry might know about strychnine. It's been in the news. Um, <laughs> Henry confidently informs William that it is a plant-based poison and cannot be traced at all. Sweet it's Jesus. It's entirely untraceable in the body oh, after God. death. It's fine. Of course. All, of all good. Of course. Because if you're reading a news report about someone who has goddamn been convicted of poisoning someone, then that is the poison to go for, people. Clearly undetectable. But if a wizard tells you... <laughs> This is this is a wizard who has saved his house. Yeah. Who has predicted marvelous things, saved his fortune and his livelihood. You're going to trust him. William Palmer, ex-doctor, you farmer boy who likes to burn shit. I think you'll get away with this and be fine. 
But William is but he perhaps is not entirely convinced what Henry what Henry says. Um, and he decides to try and confirm this information and he goes to visit a pharmacist. Um, and again, in casual conversation about the news of the day, he inquires about the effects and traceability of strychnine. The pharmacist assures him that yes, it is quite quite traceable. <laughs> <laughs> is entirely traceable. Not only is it scientifically sound, but his employer, uh, Dr. Morley, had successfully carried out the test himself only the month before Nice for someone. The pharmacist actually even goes to the lengths of showing William some medical journals that gave details about the tests that could be performed. You just know that this pharmacist <laughs> sees him coming in going, oh God, it's Bernie Deathman <laughs> from the farm who keeps burning stuff and has been talking about wizards. I'm going to get out all the evidence I possibly have seriously strychnine <laughs> we will find it detect it here is some experiments we've done yesterday yeah but a wizard told but, me yeah. well that that's what he takes away from this that's what william takes away from it does not dissuade him whatsoever from his plan <laughs> a wizard had told him um sod the scientists wizards know the way the pharmacist is yelling out the door as he's walking down the street really seriously not strychnine of all the goddamn poisons arsenic just give that a go over the course of several weeks william purchases 15 grains of strychnine 15 um, grains 15 grains from a pharmacist from various <sighs> pharmacists claiming that there was an infestation of cats at the farm that needed to be dealt with those damn cats those damn cats hey them by their tails was not good enough on the 23rd of february harriet takes to her bed in excruciating pain no. and over the next six days harriet is bedridden and racked with spasms that nearly bend her in two she dies on the 29th of february attended by a couple of local women um, who do all they can to make her comfortable and several doctors have even been called to her to attend on harriet but none have identified poison um, and their various treatments are entirely ineffective and Harriet does pass away. Harriet's death is immediately flagged as rather suspicious. William Dove has not been subtle about his purchasing of strychnine. The pharmacist clearly remembers the conversations he has had with Williams, telling him repeatedly that yes, strychnine is very much traceable and here are all the medical <laughs> journals to prove this. Williams seemed to have gone ahead anyway. Williams is arrested for his wife's murder. Good. But it would seem that he is still quite convinced that this... All must have been part of the plan. This was all part of the plan. Oh, Henry's God. wizardry would soon take effect and William would go free and then marry his new auburn-haired wife, as had been predicted originally. But as time goes on and the date of the trial gets closer and closer and closer, William becomes more and more worried that perhaps Henry's magic wasn't quite cutting it. Yeah. It's not going to do with the job. Perhaps he needs to appeal to a slightly higher power, to, to Henry's boss directly, to get things moving along. What? Um, and so he writes a letter. Right. Dear devil! No! <laughs> <laughs> Is that how it starts? <laughs> oh, it's so nice. It's, it, you know, it, not, not terribly formal. Not Mr. Devil. No. Dear, not Dear Lord of Darkness. No, no. Not, not Lucifer Morningstar. <laughs> there we are. Dear Devil. Straight in there. If you will get me clear at the Assizes, the, the court, um, and let me have the enjoyment of life, health, wealth, tobacco, beer, more food... And better my wishes granted and live till I am 60. Come to me and tell me. I remain your faithful subject, <laughs> William Duff. The brass balls this on this man. Was written in his own blood. Wow. <laughs> so he thought that all it took was write a letter in your own blood. He just crowbarred in a lot of requests on that <laughs> There's one. There's a lot of stuff there, absolutely. It's Tobacco, just... beer, yeah. food, health, life, wealth, all that. Bring it on. Not just get me off, Mr. Devil. No. Oh, no, sorry, Devil. They're on first name terms. No, just put in, and also, I'd like some smokes. I'd like some smokes, please. I'd like some smokes and some good and, snacks. And some beer. And some beer. And everything. He's just, like, lining up his Friday night, isn't he? He's like, when I get out, I would really appreciate some, uh, some tasty, tasty stuff. And then I will basically be here for you Mr. Devil yeah. there we are the devil does not appear <laughs> <laughs> and in court William's defence 
declares him insane um, and <laughs> entirely so. not responsible for his actions. Henry Harrison, the wizard, is called as a witness for the prosecution. Please, um, did he turn up at a hat? <laughs> that I don't know, unfortunately. Uh, let's but, just picture it. Let's just picture it. <laughs> but he does indeed confirm the conversations they had about strychnine. But of course, he'd never believed that William would do anything so terrible. He thought it was just casual conversation, as talking you do. about things that are in the paper at the time. The defence argue that it is entirely Henry. Henry Harrison's wizardly influence that has corrupted poor and susceptible and obviously rather mentally ill William Dove. William is indeed found guilty and is executed on the 9th of August for the murder of Harriet Dove. But what of the wizard of the South Market? What of the wizard, Nick? <laughs> what of Henry Harrison? The papers branded him Dove's evil genius. No. He was the one behind it all. And use his involvement to lament the continuing belief in witchcraft and wizardry. Um, one writes, Is it not humiliating to know that in spite of all the intellectual advancement of which we are prone to boast in this later day, there are still amongst us men and those not wholly uneducated who are capable of surrendering their reason and of weakly falling victim to arts so low and despicable as those of Harrison? Oh. After the trial, he is in greater demand than ever. <laughs> as there is obviously no such thing as bad publicity. Of course. Um, <laughs> though eventually, do things do start to fall apart for the wise man. A young woman, Eliza Croft, had visited Harrison in the hope of increasing the affections of a particular young man that she had taken a fancying to. Harrison had provided various charms and spells, but nothing seemed to be working. On one of her visits to Harrison, he suggests that a, that a greater connection between the two of them would ensure that the magic finally took hold. No. Um, the greater connection, here being a marvellously Victorian euphemism for all the sex. <laughs> <laughs> Um, if you have sex with me, he'll, t he'll totally, totally fancy you. He'll totally <laughs> fancy you. He'll take your hand and parade you down the street. Yeah. Liza, unsurprisingly, refuses this this advancement. Um, it is a step too far in her pursuit of the young man. But Harrison insists and eventually ends in assaulting Eliza. Harrison is charged with assault. And by the time he is brought to trial, public opinion had m changed against him entirely. The authorities are determined to clear up the streets of these wise men and these wise women who they believe were preying on the most gullible in the society. Oh. At his trial, the courtroom is entirely packed. And before things get underway, the judge stands and asks if there was anyone else in the room who wished to make a formal complaint against Harrison. Nice. Get it all out right get now. Get it all out. One woman steps forward. My name is Jane Harrison, she says. Mm -hmm. I am the wife of the prisoner. I am a married woman and have been married for 23 years. Okay. The only complaint I have to make against the prisoner is for neglecting his wife and family. Oh. Now, Jane is the woman he yes. left years and years and years earlier yeah. before he started in his wizardry. But obviously, his name in the paper had alerted her and yeah. she had turned up at court. At this announcement that he was in fact married to this woman and the prosecutor stands and said this is his first wife Mrs Brown we shall bring forward hereafter to show that he is his second wife. What? It's not Elizabeth Brown the landlady though. No. This is her daughter <gasps> Sarah Ann Brown who he had married after getting her pregnant. Oh my God. Not happy with two wives. No. The trial of these, a third wife, Maria Steele, who <laughs> Harrison had married in 1850. Everyone has amazing names, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> now, bigamy entirely illegal at this time. He has married... It still is. It still, it still is. is. He has married three different women, but it is also surprisingly common at this time. Yes, yes. Um, it is impossible to get a divorce unless you are incredibly wealthy and have mm. a real connection. Mm. A divorce takes an act of parliament mm. to be to be passed. So it's not for the likes of the common working class folk to get that. Mm. So it's much easier just to move elsewhere and get married again. No one yeah, knows you. Of course, move of course, on. of course. In fact, it turns out that both Sarah Ann and Maria were themselves both already married before they married Harrison. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's a whole weird confusion. A big spider's of, web big of spider's marriage. spider's web of marriage. The bigamy charges are added to the assault to ensure that Harrison is dealt with as severely as they possibly could. The judge is not sympathetic, declaring that Harrison had led a life of unparalleled profligacy. Big oh, word. Indeed. I'm surprised I could say it. Um, <laughs> the wizard of South Market was sentenced to four years hard labour. And when he was released, 
he vanished and was <gasps> never heard of again. Wizarded away. <laughs> he wizarded himself away. And that is the story of William Dove, who murdered his wife under the advice of a wizard. Yay! <laughs> Oh, good story, Nick. Oh, wizards. Wizards. Wizards are the cause of all problems in the world. And the apparently. solution to all problems in the world. <laughs> the cause of and the solution to all of life's problems. My God. Oh, that's a good story. Uh, we have so many examples, though, throughout the centuries of spiritual men. Spiritual men. I'm just going to say it. It's men. Offering incredible spiritual enlightenment or help or mysticism to help you with all your problems and they end up being grabby grabby sex men <laughs> yeah oh my god it's not good. this is the folly what happens when you go to the local village wizard and ask for advice but bloody hell i mean the farmer man was obviously i mean he was obviously a damaged child i mean torturing animals when you're a kid that's one of the key indicators of a psychopath, I believe. Indeed. Um, so William Dove was not mentally he was, stable. He was not a well man, absolutely. And obviously, Henry Harrison was a con artist, mm. I have no doubt about that, who just took advantage of a very ill young man to make a, a, probably a small fortune out of him and persuade him to do whatever he wanted him to do. And not only him, probably loads of other people who came to a wizard for mysticism for Indeed. guidance. Yeah. Uh, at a time where you're not really going to get much mental health support or anything like that. Absolutely, but you say that. But there, there was actually there was a there was a petition um, in various Leeds papers that was presented to the Queen to appeal for clemency for William Dove really? because people thought people accepted that yes he had done this terrible thing, but they knew he was unwell. They well, knew he was he was mentally ill yeah. and probably not responsible. There was a reason for his actions. He was he was that unwell. Yeah. So they appealed to Queen Victoria to say grant this man clemency and life imprisonment or something like that mm. because he was not responsible for his actions that was denied and and he was executed well, but I there were those sort of forward thinking people at the time who thought this was not right it's horrible what he did to animals and what you know the arson that he that he enacted when he was younger and killing his wife and you know well obviously <laughs> killing his wife as well but you would have thought that this when you were telling all those stories about his youth I thought you were setting this up that he mm. was a serial killer mm. that he would have committed a murder far earlier the growing of the orchard thinking that it would sprout up immediately that fattening the calf before going to market he's not well Indeed he not. is obviously insane he has killed someone and yes deserves to be punished for it but clearly unwell and has been guided by someone who you couldn't mistake the fact that he was mentally ill and no. not all there but at the time, oh, the person take, was just like, advantage. oh, yeah, yeah, just, you know, take the money. I'm a wizard. I'm yeah. a wizard. Let's talk wizardy shit. <laughs> oh, my God, Henry Harrison. Yes, and all of his wizardy stuff was just basically to have sex with lots of people. Apparently so. And take their money. Yeah. Well, they, I think probably money helped a great deal. Giving wizards and witches a bad that name. That is very true. Because there are good witches. <laughs> good story, Nick. Oh, well, what do you think, people? This is a good story for Spooky Month. There's a <laughs> wizard involved, and, and there's a murder, and there's some poison. There's some poison and some murdering, and a wizard, what's not to like? Wonderful to have the return of, as I said, Strychnine. Strychnine. Strychnine, Strychnine. You say <laughs> Strychnine, I say Strychnine. Yay! Oh, I love a bit of strychnine. Yes, I do love the energy of that pharmacist still going, definitely not. <laughs> no, no, it's not possible. Look at all these books. Look at these tests. <laughs> I love the way he went to one chemist who went, I have done a lot of bloody research on it. Whereas if, if, this, this, stuff. if this podcast has taught us nothing, it's that you can walk into many a pharmacy or just a chemist or a general store and people go, strychnine? Yeah, go and oh, have it. the pharmacist still sold it to him. <laughs> Absolutely. I, I'll sell you the shit. No, no problem at Sure, nothing illegal against that. But, but you have to <laughs> advise people against it. Indeed. <laughs> He's still insisting it's to kill cats because there was no yeah. law at the time to prevent it. Indeed not. There was no law about strychnine. No, arsenic law, uh, still too early for He's that. too early, indeed. But strychnine, so they were like, oh God, it. please. This was the one ke This was the one pharmacist in England going, we really need something on strychnine because it's horrible. <laughs> Would you please reconsider because I have to sell this to you. What do you think, people? Should wizards be blamed for everything? Everything. <laughs> no, no, I don't Anything so. bad happened, the wizard did the it. The wizard did it. Tell us what you think. Jump onto social media. Tell us what you think about this story. Tell us your theories. There are no theories no, really associated it's, it's with this. It's fairly cut and dry. <laughs> what do you think the wizard was wearing? This is true. All of this. How was he showing himself to be a wizard? Do you have a sign? 
<laughs> outside your door or on you wearing a sign going wizard wizard, wizard for wizard, hire the wizard lives here <laughs> <laughs> no, I, like, I like that in the sign at the least shop grocers and wizard <laughs> <laughs> grocers downstairs wizardry upstairs and sex question mark <laughs> question mark apparently for him <laughs> tell us what you think of it and the ferryman what yeah, a great indeed. named cocktail and a really good cocktail and an a very interesting drink it's a, a professional one, shall we say, <laughs> because you probably won't have yeah. this ingredient in the cupboard. Ah, uh, you know what? It's one to try at a very fancy cocktail place. If or you sub out Campari. Sub out Campari. For the sign Actually, you know what? Campari would work. If you feel like adding to the poisonous cabinet and you're a fan of Campari and you want something that's a bit different, get this shit in. Well, you should already have it, really. The amount of groanies everyone should be drinking. Have it by now, <laughs> no, but then sub out, but also get Campari, but also get this artichoke liqueur that you could have. Maybe you could use it in Snemnegronis. Mm, interesting. Yeah. Well, we're worth me, a try. Me, 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 me. Got a bottle of it. <laughs> Do any of you have celery bitters? <laughs> And are they worth it? Cake and do history, you can tell us. <laughs> Best shot, Co. Um, yeah, tell us about celery bitters. Are you going to mix up this drink? Or what else are you drinking this weekend? And what are you drinking for Spooky Month? Send us more pictures of cocktails that you are drinking for Spooky Month and this weekend. If you are not already a member of our Patreon, come do come and join us. There are many new episodes on there. All for but $5 a month, an entire bargain. So come and see what you think there. And you can leave if you like, but don't, because you won't want to leave. It's excellent. Also, we have some merch as well. You can see on Teespring, the links are in all the social places. Get yourself a hoodie. It's coming into winter, coming to autumn. You want to be nice and snuggly. Get a poisonous cabinet hoodie. That's what you need. And if you haven't already, please leave us a review. We've had some beautiful reviews from people recently. If you haven't had the time to leave us a review and you've been listening for a while, or if you've just joined us, jump on to the platforms that you listen to us on and leave a review. It really, really helps us get ranked on Apple. It gets us noticed by more people. A review makes all the difference, even if it's a few words and if it's a five-star review obviously thanks for listening guys we have been the people inside the poisoner's cabinet we will see you next week and remember your loved ones are trying to kill you Bye.